Horikoto, Ho Susana Ho, No Mai Horimai, Kite Kete Wananga O Turanga. Hi, my name is Susan Osteen, and I'm one of the children's librarians at Turanga Christchurch Central Library. We are delighted to have Charlotte, Hi. Marina, Hi. Alex, and Tom Hi. come down from our local school, which is Christchurch East. So it's really awesome to have the Christchurch East schools here with us today. And we also have Inglewood School in New Plymouth. Can you say kia ora and introduce yourselves, please, Inglewood? They got mute on. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Rebecca Byer, one of the Pukiriki librarians, and I've got a fantastic St. Patrick's Inglewood School with me here today, so we'll just go around and they'll introduce themselves. Um, hi, I'm Ethan. I'm Olivia. Hi, I'm Chloe. Hi, I'm Emerson. Hi, I'm Talia. Okay, so today we're very, very excited to be Zooming with you. We're here at Turanga in Christchurch, and we've got a very special guest today. We've got the author, Melinda Shamanic, and she's Hi. going to talk about her fabulous new book, Time Machine and Other Stories. First of all, congratulations, Melinda, on being nominated for a Wright Family Foundation Esther Glenn Award for Junior Fiction. That Thank is you. Awesome. We really, like your really enjoyed your wonderful stories, and we are so privileged to have you join us here today. I've been really lucky as a school librarian in the past to attend several Leanza events um, related to the Book Awards, and I've gotten to meet lots of really cool authors in person. Right now, we can all agree on one thing, and that's that these are strange, strange times around the world. And it's very interesting to be part of a virtual book event. Um, first time I've ever, ever been part of a virtual book awards event. And it's pretty cool, but I think it'd be awesome if we could actually go backwards or forwards, maybe using your time machine, and we could go to a time when we could all meet up together in person. So, without further ado, we'd like Melinda to talk a bit about herself, hopefully read to us from one of her stories, mm -hmm. and then we'll have some questions from the kids. Thank you, Melinda. Oh, thank you. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit um, about what short stories mean to me. Um, when I started writing uh, around 20 years ago, um, I wrote novels for children, I wrote picture books, I wrote poetry, and I have to admit, they weren't actually very good. And I was kind of struggling and struggling with my writing. And I was doing, um, I was studying English at university, and I was doing a class on writing for children. And I'd been reading Roald Dahl's BFG and Harry Potter's, I think the first book in the series. And we'd been talking a lot about how those writers could make even the most little things really interesting. And something important happened in my mind. And we had an assignment we had to do. And I wrote three short stories and handed them in. And I felt really proud of them. They felt very different to everything else I'd been writing up till then. And I think I got a B plus, which is pretty good. Um, <laughs> but not like super, super exciting. And then about a year later, I sent those stories off to the school journal to see if they wanted to publish them. And I got an email back from the editor and she said, I really, really like your writing. And I think my heart melted in that moment. <laughs> and then she said, um, we'd really like to publish one of those stories. And that story was the first thing I'd ever had accepted for publication. So it was a huge moment for me. And um, that story is actually in the book. It's called Last Summer. And then I kept writing short stories. Whenever an idea would come to me that seemed to fit perfectly with that length of story, and I wrote a lot of them over the years and they became really important to me because not only did they kind of start me off, but they also um, would keep being published even when 
other things weren't being published. So they kept me going and kept my my hopes up and my confidence up. And um, I just I ended up with many many short stories, which was why it was such an, a wonderful opportunity to be able to put them all in one book, time machine and other stories. <laughs> 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 it's a really lovely thing because when you read a novel, a novel is kind of huge adventures and epic journeys and big magic. And they're kind of really exciting things that we read and we wish we were having those lives. But in reality, we're having everyday lives, ordinary lives, and short stories are kind of closer to our everyday experience and they're about the little delights that we get day to day and the little adventures and and the small weirdnesses that we come across and they're very very much about being human too so I think short stories for me are like little magic and they're important to remind us that actually just the everyday and the ordinary are full of special things and it's what we're all doing every day. And of course the loveliest thing about short stories is that if you are an aspiring writer, hands up if you're an aspiring writer. Who's an aspiring writer? <laughs> yeah, okay. They're a really, really good way to start writing because they're not too long, don't take you too long to write, but they still teach you about how a story should be structured and about um, the importance of words. And you can have a lot of fun with the words in a short story um, and kind of go crazy and go nuts. And still it's a, a small thing that you can create in a day. So um, yeah, a good place to start if you're a keen writer. Yeah, um, I'm going to read a story. Okay. Which one? Um, okay, I'm going to give you a choice. Hands up if you want crocodile dreaming. Oh, I like that one. <laughs> <laughs> or smart soup is the other option. No? I really should <laughs> Um, um, okay, that, that's that's going to be difficult because one one of one lot of you want one story and the other lot of you want the other story. Um, crocodile dreaming? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Partly because I really enjoy reading out, out loud. There's a lot of fun. Um, I'll have to do a reading another day and do smarts. So. What page is that? Fifty-three. On page fifty-three. Thank you. <laughs> Crocodile dreaming. The teacher took Joseph Miller to the zoo. In fact, she took the whole class, including Joe, who was the second smallest student. Joe had red hair and more freckles than you could shake a stick at, as Granny Miller liked to say. He didn't get how a shaking stick was a way to measure anything, but Granny used it quite a lot. He also had teeth that refused to sit neatly in a straight row and wore glasses to stop the words on the board looking like hairy spiders. His classmates found all these things impossible to ignore. Maybe if Joe played sports, things would have been different. But he didn't, and they weren't. Joe liked the idea of going to the zoo. Animals seemed much less complicated than people. He tried to hide his excitement in the week leading up to the visit because the others in his class seemed to find it annoying. When the bus pulled up outside the zoo, Joe stood at the door and sniffed the earthy combination of animal fragrances. He couldn't help smiling. Hurry up, Joseph, Miss Terry called out. Stop dawdling. Hurry was Miss Terry's favourite word. She always wanted them to get on with things, to finish up and move on to a new task. But Joe, by nature, was an observer. And observation took time. The animals didn't disappoint. Miss, aren't flamingos meant to be pink? Harry Tanner asked. It hung over the railing at their enclosure. 
they're grey because of the food they eat, Joe said. When they've eaten enough shrimps and stuff, they change to pink. Quite so, Joseph, Miss Terry said. Yes, Joseph, quite so, Harry parroted. Come on, children, Miss Terry said. We have a lot of animals to get through. Now, hurry along. Llama's next. Here, Llama, eat my sandwich, Harry said, thrusting his spaghetti one through the bars of the enclosure. I want to see if it makes you change colour. <laughs> Everyone thought the Llama was going to take a bite, but instead it spat right in Harry's face. Joe couldn't stop himself. He laughed out loud. Everyone had laughed at Joe when Harry spat at him at school, and now Harry was the one with spit on his face. Joe didn't see the difference. But apparently there was one, because Harry let him have it while nobody was looking during morning tea beside the band rotunda. He wrestled Joe to the ground and hit him hard. Harry's friends egged him on. Joe tried not to cry, but his nose hurt, and he knew it would be tricky to explain to his mum and dad how his glasses were broken yet again. What's all this? asked Miss Terry when she finally noticed. They're crocodile tears, Miss. They're not real. I didn't do anything, Harry said in his own defence, out of habit, even though Joe had said nothing. Joe didn't bother mentioning that crocodiles did actually cry real tears and that it had nothing to do with pretending they felt sad when they didn't. The crack in the left-hand lens of his glasses made the zoo animals look mysterious, especially the crocodile, already a little sinister, eyeing Joe from under half-closed lids through the vapour of the climate-controlled reptile house. Crocodiles must be observers too, thought Joe. Half submerged in murky water, the creature floated perfectly still. Its knobbly patent hide made Joe think of dragons and the knights who fought them, magnificent teeth curving and pointed and long, sat outside the crocodile's lips in a predatory grin. Only a low railing separated the pond and its grassy surrounds from the visitors. This is boring, Harry said. Crocodiles never do anything and they're ugly. Let's go see the lions. Everyone was filing out, students pushing and shoving in their impatience. It might have been an accident. Who could tell in the end? But Harry's elbow caught Joe in the back as he leaned over the fence. Joe found himself falling forward, watched closely by crocodile eyes. He landed on the edge of the pond, his hands in the water. What was that beneath his hand? Laughter erupted behind him. Joe wasn't quite sure how being in danger was funny. Help, he thought. He heard a shout and something grabbed the back of his shirt. He closed his eyes, felt warm breath on the back of his neck, waited for the crocodile's jaws to close on him, to crush him, sharp teeth tearing his skin. I won't be much of a dinner, Joe thought. And then he felt himself being yanked up and out of the enclosure. It was the keeper. Joe looked back. The crocodile had not moved even though that's what they usually did when food fell down right in front of them. How odd. You should never climb into an enclosure, the keeper warned. Crocodiles are killers. There seemed little point in Joe saying he'd been pushed. Yes, he said instead, and thank you. He listened patiently, one fist tightly closed around the mystery object from the pond as the keeper lectured him about keeping safe in zoos before moving off to attend to his next task. The room had emptied. Joe looked around to be sure before opening his hand out. A large yellowed crocodile tooth lay across his palm. Joe's heart skipped a beat. He popped the tooth in his pocket and glanced at the crocodile. Thanks for not eating me, he said. The crocodile blinked, a slow, single tear sliding down its cheek. I'll try and come back for another visit soon, said Joe. It'll be okay. 
and he hurried off to find Miss Terry and the others. His parents told Joe to be more careful when he showed them his broken glasses after school that day. They fished his spare pair out of the hall cupboard and handed them to him. It felt so much better not to have a fault line running through his eyesight. Joe didn't tell them about the tooth. Instead, he put it under his pillow as he got into bed that night. He dreamed. His nose filled with the scent of animals rising up from the ground beneath him. Zebras, antelope, giraffes and lions and darker things, hyenas, man. He moved forward slowly across the grass, twitching from side to side, his tail sweeping the ground behind him, his claws dug into the earth. He blinked a lazy movement, and felt his teeth slide over his lips as his mouth clamped shut. Joe felt powerful, hungry, and confident. He reached the river edge and slid into the water, surging forward as the fluid took his weight. Reeds swayed, silt from the riverbed swirling with his movement. Thin, sharp shapes darted. Fish too small for his appetite. This was his domain. Here, the rules were simple. Here, he felt at home. Good sleep, Joe's mum asked as she poured cereal into his bowl the next morning. Mm, Joe replied, telling his mum maybe or no would only lead to a difficult chat between them. He felt the tip of the crocodile tooth in his shorts pocket. Joe smiled at his mum and pushed his glasses up. He felt different when he walked through the school gate. He was still a boy, but he also felt his tail sweeping the ground behind him, his eyelids close and open in a slow, lazy blink, and his teeth, his teeth felt sharp. Harry was waiting for Joe as he often did halfway along the corridor leading to their classroom, right in front of the hook where Joe would have to stop and hang his school bag. Have a nice swim in the crocodile pond yesterday, Harry asked, smirking as he folded his arms and puffed out his chest. Yes, I did, thanks. I felt right at home, Joe replied. His tail twitched, his jaws closed. And Joe rolled with his prey. Snap. Just crocodile tears, Joe said to the gathering crowd as he hung his bag up and headed to the classroom. Now. <laughs> Thank you. That was good. <laughs> I wouldn't say that's the end of the story, but actually, if you read the story straight after it, it kind of continues. <laughs> Who's read the story after Time Machine 2? Yeah. <laughs> it tells you what happens to Harry. What happens? So if you, very if you want to know what happens next, you yeah. have to read the next story. Excellent. Oh, thank you very much, Belinda. There's nothing I like more than being read to aloud and having the actual author of the book read it to you is extraordinarily you. special. So thank you. Thank you. That was one of my favorites from the collection. So big cool. treat for that today. Um, I think now we'll start um, and we'll maybe go back and forth. We'll have a Christchurch East question, then an Inglewood question, then back and forth until we get okay. um, all of our students um, to, to ask you something they're interested in. So if that suits you. Yes, that sounds good. Any surprises? Um, so first off, um, who, who would like to, who's our first question here? Me. Okay, so can you just introduce yourself and then? Hi, my name is Tom and I, my, my first question is, um, how old were you when, when you found out you wanted to write? I decided I wanted to be a writer when I was about nine. I kind of, um, I fell in love with books and I thought reading books was the most, uh, the best thing to do, the most fun. Um, yeah. And I thought I want to do what writers do. Okay. So yeah, quite young. Okay, yeah. hey, thank you. Now, Inglewood, if you've got a question ready. Uh, me, Jennifer, um, introduce yourself. 
Hi, um, I'm Ethan, and we read that you enjoy um, reading, baking, going to the movies and traveling. Um, do any of these influence your writing? Um, they do. They all do. Uh, everything you do, every experience you have, uh, you know, is something that you take in and absorb, and it kind of mixes around with everything else. And... Uh, so I've got going to the movies. Going to the movies is really good because there's always a writer behind the story that makes the movie. And it's really cool to kind of see how they've done it and how they've made their story work. Um, it's a bit tricky because after a while, you sometimes find yourself actually enjoying the movie less and picking apart the story more. Uh, <laughs> it's a really good way to see how good stories work. Um, baking, I put a lot of food into my stories. Um, it's something I love to do, but it's also something that we, we, all, we all need to eat. And so food and eating is often an element in, a, in the stories that I write. Um, I guess if you think about Crocodile Dreaming, it was more about not being eaten or not <laughs> eating. <laughs> um, one of the things I think about baking as well is that it's something you do often with love. So making food for other people is a, a gesture of love. And I often write about families, so it seems a good thing to include. And travel, travel just expands your mind and shows you how other people live. And that's a really useful thing to put into your stories as well. Thank you. Everything helps. Okay, great. Um, next up, we are ready again for Christchurch East. Um, it is Alex, but he's going to Alex and we'll go to Charlotte. Okay. Where do you get your ideas from? Um, a kind of, that's a good question to follow on from the one we just had before about um, uh, doing the things I love, because I get my ideas from daily life. Now, when it comes to the short story collection, a lot of those stories are actually based on things that happened to me. And if they didn't happen to me, they were things that might have happened to my children. So it's day-to-day -day experience, and that's the beauty of a short story as well, is that it can just be a little episode from your life, something that um, made you have a strong feeling or changed your mind about something. Uh, so, everyday life, and that's the advantage I have being the age I am, is that I've had a lot more of everyday life, so it's easier for me to get ideas now. Um, mm -hmm. Having ideas is like exercising a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it gets and the more ideas you have. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Ingrid, what, have you got Ingrid, another question ready to go? If any of us completed a piece of writing that we would like published for a school journal or somewhere else, could we send it to you for critiquing and suggestions? I think if it was just your group, definitely. <laughs> I, I think if every student around the country sent them to me, I'd be a bit, um, I might be a bit overwhelmed. Um, but I'd be happy to look at anything that you guys write. Awesome. That's lucky kids. <laughs> Oh, and if you if you like um, writing regularly, um, we run an online competition called Fabo Story. I don't know if you guys have seen it, F A B O, and we've got our, it's got its own little um, blog site. And I've just put a story starter up on Monday, um, and the competition will close on the thirty first of July. So it's a really really good way to practice your writing. Excellent. We'll, well, we'll pass that on to the teachers and principals. Oh. Awesome. Fabulous story sounds very cool. Okay, your turn. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Marina. Um, what is your process for writing? My process for writing? Um, the pro my process for writing is that I don't really have a process. Uh, no, that's not entirely <laughs> true. Uh, but it does change from story to story. And sometimes I'll have a really strong idea and I'll just stop what I'm doing and sit down and get it all down. But that doesn't happen with novels. That only happens with short stories and picture books. Yeah. Um, 
And the stronger the idea, the better. So sometimes you need to spend quite a bit of time at the beginning thinking about how the story is going to work. And I like to know how a story is going to finish. So I kind of need to nut out the plot a little bit before I get going. Um, and then I just sit down and write when I feel like I've got the next part to write. So sometimes it can take a very long time and then I get to the end of the first draft and then I go back and uh, hands up who is ever told by their teachers that they need to edit their work. <laughs> Editing <laughs> is a really, really important part of the process. So once I've got to the end of the story for the first time, I go back and read through it again and again and fix it up and decide if it means what I want it to mean, and if I've included everything that needs to be included. And then I take out half the commas. <laughs> um, and sometimes there are gaps as well, so you leave gaps because you know you need to put stuff in. So it's uh, thinking about the idea until it's really strong, sitting down when you can and writing that first draft, and then editing, and then I send it off to a publisher and hope that they like it. Yeah. <laughs> and I use the computer. I generally write on a computer, but if I have ideas out, I'll always have a notebook or a scrap of paper, or I'll type things into my phone just so I don't forget. <laughs> Do you ever wake in the middle of the night with ideas and have to jot them down? But not so much waking up in the night, but last thing going to bed just as I'm starting to fall asleep, which is such a nuisance because you know, everyone's kind of, all the lights are off and it's like, oh gosh, I, but I know I need to get up and write it down, otherwise it will be gone in the morning. Excellent. But Fuzzy Doodle was a last, a, an idea last thing at night and I did get up and write it down. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm That's a wonderful story. So. <laughs> I like that story. Sorry. The butterflies are cute. Okay, Englewood, are you ready with another question? Um, hi, I'm Olivia. Are any of the stories based on true events? They are. Uh, probably the one that is most based, oh well, there's quite a few of them in the short story collection, so now's good where they're going in the cart down the hill is based yeah. on my own experience. Yes. Drawing Horses is probably the truest of all the stories because that's exactly how it happened. Yeah. Life. Uh, last summer, and I think there's one other one that's based on um, my own experiences, but uh, the other one that's quite important is A Winter's Day in 1939. And the short story in here is kind of based on my dad's life as a boy in Poland. Um, so he was 12 when World War II started. Really? Yeah, and I wrote the short story <laughs> and it appeared in um, an Australian school magazine. And then uh, Scholastic got in touch with me and said, we really like the story. Would you be interested in making it a book? And so I wrote the book A Winter's Day in 1939. And that's my dad's, um, from about 12 to about 15, that's his story. I think I read that one. Cool. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm, I'm always using my own life uh, in my stories, even if it's just a little bit of my own experience. So that one, and I recall history is really cool. <laughs> Day, that was also either an award winner or a finalist, if I'm correct. Yeah. As was Fuzzy Doodle. And yes. Yeah, a, fun. Few, a few others. Wear Nana, maybe? Wear yes, Nana. the Wear Nana. So yeah. you're no yeah. you're a regular, you're a... <laughs> I, I, I <laughs> try to come back regularly. regularly. <laughs> yeah, and um, Day. Um, Congratulations. Okay, so uh, Alex. Alex. A Librarian's oh. Choice Award. Excellent. Yep. Have you guys got any more questions? Alex, Christchurch East. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Excellent. One more from Christchurch East. Right. Oh, oh, a couple more. Yeah. But <laughs> okay. How has um, COVID impacted your writing? That's a really good question. Um, it was interesting because at the at the very beginning of lockdown, um, I think probably because 
everyone was at home with me. I was very um, diligent and did a lot of hard work. <laughs> and I wrote a picture book um, right at the beginning. And then I slowed down completely and I've only just started writing something new about a week ago. Um, so I, it, it kind of... It kind of stopped me writing for a while because it was very strange. Did you feel strange, you guys? Yeah. 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 It was good though, eight weeks of school. So <laughs> yeah. You would have done some schoolwork and was it weird doing Yeah, this? we still had to do I Gmail did. and stuff like that. I didn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> we didn't yeah. have to do any Zoom calls though. <laughs> was it was a very strange <laughs> time. And yeah. Well, productivity and then nope. no productivity and fits and starts of doing things and not doing things and yeah very strange times it was and I think um, when you're busy having a lot of feelings sometimes so having a lot of feelings all at once can make you very productive creatively but other times it's just overwhelming on its own and you think I just I don't know I don't know where to begin how do words work how do I put them on the page so I was kind of, <laughs> it was it was strange. So yeah, not the best. Yes, here in here in Christchurch, we often compared it to um, post earthquake days when we all had we called it quake brain, and we just kind of walked around. Yeah. A bit hard to concentrate, a bit hard to focus, and um, COVID brain felt a bit like that at times. Well, yeah, you, it's been a, a very very tough. Um, number of years for you guys and I think the COVID thing has made the rest of the country appreciate those yeah, difficulties yeah. so yeah it's given an insight Okay we'll pass back over Englewood have you got another question ready for Melinda? Um, where do you find your illustrators and editors and do they change according to the book or story you write? Oh yes they do uh, the editor depends, so I don't send my story to anyone else. Once I've finished editing it, I um, oh, occasionally I'll ask a friend what they think, but usually I'll just send it off to a publisher. And then the editor at the publishers will be the one who helps me polish the story until it's ready to be a book. Um, as far as illustrators go, uh, I haven't, been the one to choose and it's always been the publisher's choice and that's kind of the way it should work because they're the one that are they're the ones paying for the book to be printed and, and produced and they know more um, illustrators than I do and they want to go out and pick someone who they think will be the best fit for the story and I've always been happy to let them do it I've been really lucky I've been um, put together with some really amazing illustrators, um, such as Donovan Bixley for Fuzzy Doodle. And I don't know if you have seen The Wear Nana, but that was Sarah Anderson. And she's just amazing. She did wonderful um, illustrations. The illustration for this one was real good. Oh, stunning. Absolutely. Uh, that... Um, Cody. Uh, yes. Um, Dominique Ford. Yep. And Nikki Slade Robinson for sharing with Wolf, and they're all very different, and they all bring a different kind of vibe to the story. So you just trust that they're going to pick the right people, and you might be surprised to hear that I don't say anything about how the pictures should look. It's wow. totally up to the illustrator. That's so, interesting. unless I see something in the picture that shouldn't. I really think shouldn't be there. I don't say anything. Um, it was interesting sharing with Wolf the way the characters looked um, drawn and then yeah. stuck on the page. That really struck me as, as an interesting style. Can you speak to that style at all? Uh, it's kind of got a 3D effect, which yeah. I really like. And it's, and it's cool. <laughs> for illustrations, it kind of really brings it to life um which is kind of cool and i that was totally nikki and she was um 
she just went off and did her own thing and, and I, I'm so thrilled with um, the result. And the lovely thing is that she added the extra little bits in the um, knitting bag at the bottom oh. of the <laughs> and it's in the knitting bag that came from page to page. As a children's oh. librarian, it looked to me almost like a puppet show the way they were on the page and it was quite cool. Yeah, and for, some, for something that's 2D, two-dimensional, it's quite organic looking like it has a, a kind of I don't know it does look like it's a, a puppet show or a play a bit of theatre um, but the cool thing is with illustrators is that they often put extra things in that I never even dreamed of and that's a cool kind of series of easter eggs for readers like you guys and that's something I did with the short stories as well where I really wanted even though they were written at different times and each story stands alone I want. I, I like the fact that there are actually connections between the stories, and if you're an eagle-eyed reader, you will spot <laughs> things recurring, um, which is yeah, a bit of fun for me, and hopefully a bit of fun for you as well. Okay, so now we are back here, um, Christchurch East. Have you guys got um, another question? Yeah, one more. I think we have one more from our side. <laughs> oh, we've got lots more. <laughs> um, what is your favourite story that you didn't write? Oh, um, gosh. I have so many stories that I just love. Um, I mean, I've, I've been reading all my life since I learned to read, and um, probably every year there's a, fa a new favourite um, that comes on board. Um, so my, I love Coraline by Neil <laughs> I've seen the movie of that. Oh, I read the book. It's a great movie. Book is amazing. I love uh, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. I love a book called The Scorpio Races by Maggie Stiefvater, which is young adult, which is just wonderful. Um, and there's another young adult one that I really like by an Australian writer called Sonia Hartnett called Sleeping Dogs. But that's definitely a, a young adult story. Um, the Lord of the Rings. I read that every year for about 13 years. <laughs> it's a big book. Um, the Hobbit. Um, Little House on the Prairie. Yes. Visit of Earthsea. <laughs> Um, fairy tales. I love them all. <laughs> it sounds like you, you spend a fair bit of your time um, when you're not writing. It sounds like you might be reading. Is that? If you're a writer, I think it's incredibly important to be a reader as well because reading, reading is where I learnt what good writing looks like. You know, how to structure a sentence, where to put punctuation, um, uh, how to make uh, uh, descriptions come alive. It's all in good stories. So to be a good writer, I think you need to be a good reader. They go hand in hand. They sure do. Englewood, have you got another question? We've got some more questions here. Anything would you like? Oh. What inspired the characters in these stories? Hmm. Uh, some of the characters are me <laughs> in the short story collection. And it's kind of interesting. Um, uh, would be good to go through all the short stories in Time Machine and see how many times I don't actually give the character a name and you don't know if it's a boy or a girl and they don't get described at all. Um, and I think when that happens, sometimes that's because it's me. <laughs> I thought, I don't need to describe me. I know what I look like. Um, so I think some of the time there are little bits of me in the characters. Sometimes there are little bits of my children or people I know very well. And sometimes they're kind of just a collection of other people that I've met. Um, I guess the one that's closest to somebody, if it's not me, um, is in A Winter's Day in 1939, because that's my dad. 
And my dad was a very gentle, um, animal-loving, caring guy. So it was nice to be able to have him as a character in my story. Wonderful. Thank you. So I've got a question. Um, and then I think we'll get one more from Englewood, one more from these guys. And then we'll probably need to wrap things up. But okay. I, my question is about time machines. If you could travel to the past or the future, which would you choose and why? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many interesting, interesting places. The unfortunate thing with time travel is that we would only really want to do it if we could be someone who was rich and important and <laughs> successful because nobody wants to go back and live as um, a slave or a servant or, uh, you know, have a difficult, horrible life. <laughs> I'd love to go back to the Middle Ages. I'd love to go back to Shakespeare's time and go to one of his plays in the Globe Theatre. I'd love to go back to... Um, the 1920s, <laughs> sort of between World War I and World War II when everyone was very hopeful and there was a lot of um, interesting and exciting things happen, happening and a lot of creative things happening. Uh, but yeah, the truth is we couldn't control who we appeared as and I'm, I, I wouldn't cope as a slave. <laughs> I think I like being here, even if it's a difficult time. Um, it's exciting to be alive now. It's, it's you know, it's, it's the life we know best. Okay, so um, Christchurch East, this will be your last question. What inspired you to write my favourite story um, by you, um, Kauri? Song of Kauri? Yeah. The Song of Kauri. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I went to the movies years ago um, with my husband before we were married, and it was a film festival movie. What movie was it? I don't even remember. <laughs> but there was a short movie before it, and it was about a tree, kind of a tree out in a field, and, you know, the birds came and went, and the seasons came and went, and then eventually the birds landed in the branches, and took the tree away and I remember coming out of the picture theatre thinking oh, that would make such a great book and so that was what gave me the, the idea and then I didn't write the story for about another 15 years it was just kind of percolating in my head and it was so lovely to make it a kauri tree um, and kind of think about the environment here in New Zealand and how we want to protect it. And it's nice that um, the book is in support as well of uh, uh, protecting the kauri against kauri dieback. So kind of all came together very nicely. But movies, movies can be a very good inspiration. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. And Inglewood, if you'd like to ask your last questions and then wrap things up with Melinda, that would be wonderful. If you could give us some advice about writing at school and for our age, what would it be? I think the best thing you can do is three things. The first thing is read a lot of books. And they can, all books, good books, bad books, um, picture books, novels, uh, graphic novels, everything. Um, the more you read, the more idea you'll have about a, what a good story is. And you'll know what a bad story is and you'll know not to write that. Um, then I would say lots of practice. Uh, so keep writing. Write every time there's an opportunity. Um, so things like Fabo Story, that's during Term 2 and Term 3, we usually run it every fortnight. So that's a good way to practice your writing. Um, so just every chance you get, write. And the third thing is to make friends with other writers because they, um, they are the ones who know what it's like to want to be a writer and so they'll share all your um, hopes and they'll um, share ideas and they'll share um, uh, um, oh, 
when at my age, what we share, because I know a lot of writers, what we share is opportunities. Oh, I saw there's a competition where you can send your story. Um, I know that such and such a publisher is looking at work at the moment. So making friends with other writers is just a really, really good thing to do. That would be my advice. <laughs> so practice, start practicing now. Why is this book, oh wait, yeah. Why is this book structured with both short stories and a no novella or short novel? Uh, I wrote the novella Pirate Eye probably about 10 years ago and it was just after they'd stopped publishing stories that length and I tried to get it published in a whole lot of different places and they were like, oh, we really like this, but no, it doesn't quite fit with what we're publishing now. And I thought this may be my only chance to have this story <laughs> appear in a book. And so I, I popped it on the end and I'm really pleased I did. I'm glad it's had its moment in the sun because I think otherwise it might never have um, been uh, published. And all the rest are, are short stories. So um, it's just a little bonus tacked on the end. <laughs> Do you have any other questions from the number? Oh, um, do you have any suggestions for comic strips? Like, yeah. mm. For reading them or for writing them? Suggestions? Oh. Usually, I'm I'm uh, not as familiar with. I like graphic novels, but I don't. I'm not familiar with writing them. But there's some really great ones out now, so I would recommend just reading as many of them as you can. I know there's um, Raina Telgemeier is an American graphic novelist, and she's got a few out. One's called Smile. One's called Guts. Oh, yeah, I've seen those in the, um, the book. Yeah, she's really good. And there's a New Zealand guy who's just put a... a graphic novel out called The Inkberg Enigma, and that's Jonathan King. I think it's just come out, and it looks really, really good. And then there's things like Tintin and Asterix and Obelix. Um, <laughs> reading those is the best way to, to see how those stories are structured. Um, yeah. The only thing is you do need to make sure that you, like, I don't know how you go about sorting the illustrations it might I'm not sure whether you would need to find the illustrator earlier in the piece because it's very much um, the two the text and the pictures work really closely together so you'd need to think about that quite early on yeah maybe I can draw them as well so, yeah. yeah thank you okay cool Melinda, thank you very much for your time today on behalf of St. Pat's Angle and Pukiriki Libraries and um, Christchurch East and uh, Christchurch City Libraries. We we're really pleased to have you today and um, it's been great hearing uh, a bit of advice for everybody and hearing the story and best of luck with the awards. Thank you so much. It's been, uh, I've really enjoyed this. It's, it's been great to meet all you guys. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank, you Kira, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Happy reading. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.